Thank you so much for joining us as we continue looking at Christ-centered education and going through all the different characteristic traits. Today I'm sitting with Sarah Campbell and we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means to live in community. So 1 Corinthians 12 describes that as Christians we are all part of a body of Christ and since we've been called to be a part of the body and we've been called to play a role within the church at large, what does it mean really to live in community? Well, whenever I think of living in community, I don't think it can be separated from a conversation of I am created. Because whenever we think of I am created, we are created in the image of a triune God. And so he himself is community. And if he built us that way to reflect his image, if we are not living in community, then we are not really reflecting the image of God. And so he has built our, our whole uh, biblical standards on that way. He's built all of us being able to serve one another in that way. And whenever we are separated from community, we are not going to be able to flourish in the way that he wants us to. So when we think of living in biblical community, I think we have a perfect example in the early church in Acts 2, whenever they give us what they have dedicated themselves to. They have dedicated themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowshipping with one another, to breaking bread and to prayer. And here at BCS, when we think of living in community, I think this is how we set ourselves apart and how we really set up our natural rhythm, even starting at BCDC all the way up to graduation. I think that's a perfect lead into our next question. How are we already exemplifying this within the BCS community? Well, like you said in 1 Corinthians 12, I think it starts even at BCDC, whenever our teachers are modeling for the young children how to actually live in community and what it can be to go to the chapel and fellowship with one another, how we're praying over one another and what community should be like. My son is at BCDC and so Every year they have these fun food fellowships where they invite the parents in and the kids are actually serving each other and they're serving the parents and the families. And so I think the teachers are modeling for even our youngest children what it means to live in community. But going into elementary school, that natural rhythm is still continued, but the the first Corinthians 12 principle of all of us having a purpose, all of us having a role is starting to be drawn out where the teachers are actually seeing in one another the value, they are establishing value of each student and helping for each student to start to realize that in one another that I have a purpose, I have a plan, mm -hmm. I have a reason for being a part of this community and so do you. And if we are not fulfilling that, we are not actually going to flourish in the way that God has designed. So in elementary, I think it's a lot of modeling, a lot of modeling how to resolve conflict, a lot of um, really helping them to understand how we serve one another. And then once they get into middle, middle school and high school, it's really student led. And it's so awesome to see how they have established their own um, prayer prayer times with one another. The eighth grade uh, girls actually have set up for elementary students where they come in and they are doing prayer in the morning with one another. The high school students do prayer on the bridge every single morning, praying over all of our students and our, our faculty and just our campus. So this is something that they are leading in because they've been trained all the way at BCDC to realize that this is a natural rhythm in our Christian walk. I love that it seems that it's just integral in who we are, that it's not something that we have to force to kind of get our community involved um, and you know, really caring about each other, that it's just part of, of Bethesda. Mm -hmm. You mentioned resolving conflict. So does it mean that if we live in community that we're not going to have any conflict? Absolutely not, because just like everything else, we have been broken by the fall. And so we have been designed for community and without community, we won't flourish. But because of sin and because of our sin nature, we are going to mess it up over and over again. And working with the elementary students on um, conflict and how we can resolve conflict, how we can recognize in one another that I'm going to treat you like you were created in the image of God, just like myself, but how it can look whenever we forget that, whenever we don't treat each other that way every single day and helping them to understand that this is how you can resolve conflict in a healthy way to where we can not just 
be okay for right now, but how we can actually, um, just like God is redeeming us into community with Him, we can have this community redeemed with one another. And in the upper school, I'm super excited to be able to just help them to be able to discover in themselves what their needs are, what their goals are, so that they can actually understand this is what I need to be able to communi communicate and live in community community, but this is also what you need. And I want to be able to serve you in that way. So really realizing that as a community, I can't just think about myself. I've got to put you in front of me so that you can also flourish and thrive as much as I am. But there are going to be conflicts and we have to learn how to resolve those in a healthy way that is going to really create a better community for all of us. And I love the way that our faculty model that for our students. I love the way that our PMD is involved with our faculty and our students all the time where they're up here and they are serving us and serving one another to where we can, or as the students, they can start to see this is how we should be treating one another. And I am not the most important in this way. So I need to be a part of this community. I think it's so incredible when we're looking at each individual characteristic here that they all kind of point back to we're created that when you understand that you're created it makes it so much easier for me to look at you and say you're also created and so here are the ways that I need to treat you mm -hmm. um, and so with that it comes with resolution conflict and that when we are able to sit down and resolve a conflict that allows us the opportunity to to have a deeper relationship at the end of it. Absolutely. And I think that's really what community is. It's not just this surface level, hey, how are you doing? It's the nitty gritty where we are actually recognizing each other's flaws, each other's pain, but also each other's gifts. And I love that our teachers model that for the elementary students to be able to recognize the gifts, but they're also recognizing a student doesn't just have to say, I'm having a hard day. We can see that in one another. And in the upper school, the students start to do that for one another where it's not just a surface level relationship. We've got to go deeper because that's what real community is. That's what the fellowship is in the, in the early church. It, church it's us, us actually saying to one another, what are your needs? How can I support you in that? And also to be able to say, I'm gonna hold you accountable to that. I'm not just going to let you say, this is how I'm feeling, this is what I need right now, but I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna keep on checking on you and I'm going to keep on praying for you. And if we're not doing that, it's not real community, it's just a like on Instagram. So is it fair to say that we don't want individualistic Christians in the sense that we, um that we don't want Christians living in silos. Absolutely, if you have separated yourself out of the community, then like I said in the beginning, you are not reflecting the image of God and you are going to find yourself where you are not in a healthy place whenever you have removed yourself. Whenever we ded dedicate ourselves to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, it's not just about going to church or coming to chapel, it's about participating in it and belonging in that space. And whenever we don't, whenever we've removed ourselves from that, there are going to be some serious ramifications in all of us, no matter how successful you are in your career or as a student, you are going to see ramifications whenever you have removed yourself because we are innately designed, we crave community, first with our savior, but then also with one another. So then what happens when we pull out of community? Whenever we pull out of community, I think it is the easiest way for the devil to get a foothold in our lives. Because whenever we are in those secret, quiet, dark spaces, it's where God really wants to speak to us, but it's also where the devil can really speak to us as well. There are more times whenever I hear from, especially upper school students where they feel okay whenever they're here at school, but as soon as they get home and they're alone and they're in their rooms, that's where they start to have overwhelming sadness. It's where they start to feel lonely. They feel even depressed. They feel like they are less than, like they don't have any skills to offer the world. And those are all lies. Like we can recognize that clearly as this is a lie, but whenever you are not around someone who's able to stop you and say, hey, 
that's a lie, then you're going to start to believe it. And as you listen more and you separate yourselves more, it's going to start to embed itself in the person that you are. And so when we're here at school as the counselor here, and I know as the faculty, we're always watching for just differences in our students because we have gotten to know them and we know when something is off and we are going to try to call them out but whenever they are separated from us whether they're just here on campus and they're not around us or whenever they get home or in their own community that's whenever they really can remove themselves from the community that's going to hold them accountable so it's it's something that we try to teach them and I try to get with them one-on-one -on -one and train them for whenever you're outside of this place, here are the things that you need to do to be able to make sure that you're connected. But it's also something that we have to have our families partner with us to be able to make sure community is happening at home as well. So when we're looking at our, um, our own community here, how, like what would you, what advice would you give us that if we see someone that maybe they're starting to pull out of the community, how can we pull them back in? How can we support them through that? I think the best thing to do is to go to that person and ask them, how are you? And don't settle for an I'm good, I'm okay. Actually ask them, how are you eating? How are you sleeping? What are you doing with your free time? Ask the questions that would help you to recognize something is a little bit off. Ask them about what they did over the weekend. Did they go to church? Did they spend time with their family? Did they do anything at all or did they just sleep? Ask them real questions and then whenever they can give you an answer, then ask again, how are you really doing? But as a student, they're not equipped to be able to help with the after that. They need to come to a faculty member or come to me as the counselor to be able to help that student who maybe is struggling a little bit with what the next steps would be. But as a friend, you can always be devoted in prayer because that is something that no matter how young you are, you are equipped to be able to do that and to be able to say, your burden is my burden and I'm going to help you handle that and I'm gonna be here for you and every single time I see you, I'm gonna ask you again how you're doing and I'm gonna eat with you. We're gonna spend time together. That's what community is and not just letting it drop because it's uncomfortable. So that's amazing advice for what we can do here on campus, but what can families do? That's a great question because like I said, whenever they are here, whenever our students are here, we're able to watch them, we're able to support them, but I hear more often whenever the students are at home is where they're really struggling because they isolate themselves in their rooms and even though they feel like they're a part of a community because they're on Snapchat or Instagram, that's not real community. That's not someone who can actually be there when they need them and it gives them a false sense of friendship to not know what a real friend is. So I would say as a parent, building a community in your home needs to center around all of those four things where you are devoting yourself to the teaching, you're devoting yourself to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. That needs to be your natural rhythm in the home just like it is here. So there are studies that say that if you can eat at least two meals as a family a week, you are gonna lower the rate of depression, of suicide, of substance abuse, of premarital sex in your students just by doing that simple act, by eating a meal together. It makes a huge impact because those are the everyday faithfulness times where you can actually sit down and get to know your student and how they are doing in the everyday things that they're dealing with. And also make sure that if your student is off in their room, whether they're working on homework or they're on social media or playing a game or whatever, that you're making sure that maybe the door is open if there is an issue, but that there is an open door policy with you being able to walk in and being able to speak with them at any time. But I also think one of the most important things that we see from 
our alumni especially, is that once they leave Bethesda, they may or may not continue to attend a church. And a lot of that starts from the family. If it has not been established as this is important to us, this is what is going to maintain our spiritual health and our mental health, they are not going to continue that after they graduate. So it must be a priority for a family to say, this is important because if, as a family, if the parents or um, whomever, if they are not dedicating themselves to a community where they are not just attending, but they are belonging, they aren't modeling that for their students and they aren't going to understand what that really looks like in their own life to establish a real lifelong mental and spiritual health for themselves. That's awesome to hear and just like that it's not just on campus, that it really is a community thing, that we're partnering with the family for the development of their child. Absolutely, and it is for their lifelong health. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah, for being here. What you said was super insightful, and I feel like you gave our community just tangible actions that they can take back with them. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure that you're following us on Facebook or Instagram to get all of our video updates, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play to hear our Christ-Centered Education Podcast.